Sorry, everyone. We'll be starting in a second. Are we ready? We're still waiting for. But it's not here. No. Shall we wait for it? Probably. director of Dead Center. And I'm Ben Kidd, the other co-artistic director. Welcome to the ATRL. Have any of you been here before? Yes. 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 All but invisible when you're passing it in the street. Not many people know it exists, but it really is an amazing facility. And we're very grateful to the School of Creative Arts for allowing us access. And of course, to the Trinity Creative Challenge for supporting this development. And is Christina? Is Christina Reynolds? Ah, yes, there you are. Uh, Christina is the project coordinator for this award, so a special thanks to her for everything so far. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> so, the plan this afternoon is to give you an overview of our project and share some of our research. But the, the thing with these showings, they can be a bit confusing. People expect to see something finished, but it's not a show. There's nothing to see here. It's more like a discussion. So. The project we're working on is called Beckett's First Play and forms part of Dead Center's research into the early work of the 20th century's great masters. Previously, we made a work titled Chekhov's First Play based around Chekhov's unfinished first play, which he wrote when he was 19 years old. Um, maybe we should show a small clip uh, so you, you know, give a context of who we are. Okay, yeah, I think I have it here. Give me a second. <laughs> I'm going to start by doing a little sound check. Um, you should be hearing me in your left ear, and then now you should be hearing this in your right ear. You should be hearing this in your right ear. You're probably wondering why you're wearing headphones. Chekhov's first play is really complicated and messy. So I thought I'd set up a director's commentary to help explain what's going on, what it's about, and why you should like it.
think that's well understood. See it everywhere you look. People just ain't no good. So that was check one. And now we are turning our attention to Samuel Beckett's never performed play, Eleutheria, written in 1947, a year before his slightly better known work, Waiting for. Ah, oh. oh. <laughs> uh. here I am. Here you are. Sorry I'm late. Were you waiting long? No, no, just got started. Oh, ah, you're using that chair. Uh, that's usually. You want this? No, no, not at all. This is. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just a few student issues. That's why I'm looking a bit. Oh, hello, everybody. Oh, hey, Christina. Do you want to introduce yourself? Why not? I'm Nicholas Johnson, and I work as an assistant professor in the Department of Drama here at Trinity College. I'm the director of the Beckett Summer School. Yes, and the plan for the afternoon, as I said, is to let you know what we've been working on. Shall we start with a bit about the play, Beckett's first play, Eleutheria? I think that's a good idea. Start at the start. Why not? Maybe, Nick, you'd like to tell everyone a bit about the background. When and why Beckett wrote this play, or why he started writing plays anyway. And, and also, I guess, why most people have never heard of it, or why it's never been performed. Sure. So, we might as well start off with the title. Uh, Eleftheria, it's actually the Greek word for freedom, which is a career-long obsession of Beckett's, as many of his works concern the limits of human freedom. What you can do, if anything, how you can live, if you can be said to live at all. In his first play, he writes the story of a character called Victor Krapp, who turns his back on his life, his family, his fiance, his career prospects, so on, and he goes to live in what is effectively a squat, in a state of near catatonic paralysis. The action of the play, more or less, follows all the characters around Victor trying to understand what's wrong with him and why he's totally withdrawn from the world. So the play basically rejects all forms of diagnosis or explanation, ending up with a picture of humanity as inexplicable, stuck, and most probably not free. And actually, picking up on that idea of not being free, the play itself, I think I'm right in saying, cannot be performed. The rights to perform any theory are not available. That's correct. So we can't do it. We cannot. Why can't it? <laughs> well, basically, Beckett wasn't happy with it. He was right. It's not very good. <laughs> Bush, I, I don't know that I'd go that far. <laughs> you know, come on, it's nothing like any of his other work. It's got loads of characters, loads of scene changes, and some really bad writing. All his work is known for its minimalism, and this play is full-on maximalism. Uh, nothing like the striking stage images of his later work. It's just tables and chairs and people talking. It does seem really incredible that he wrote this play at the same time as he was writing Godot. That's correct, isn't it, Nick? Indeed. In the 1940s, it was being shopped around by Beckett's partner, Suzanne, who was more or less acting as his literary agent at the time. And yes, interestingly, it was being offered to producers at exactly the same time as Anatandon Godot. So why was Godot produced and not Eleutheria? Well, in a word, it was cheaper. Less actors. Actors are expensive. Hmm. I'd love to do a play without actors. <laughs> I've actually got a quote here that might be helpful. It's from <laughs> Roger Blanc, the director of, uh, who first stage waiting for Godot. He says this. Eleutheria had 17 characters, a divided stage, elaborate props, and complicated lighting. I was poor. I didn't have a penny. I couldn't think of anyone who owned a theater suitable for such a complicated production. I thought I'd be better off with Gatto because there were only four actors and they were bums. They could wear their own clothes if it came to that, and I wouldn't need anything but a spotlight and a bare branch for a tree. Nice. With such reasoning, was theater <laughs> history shaped. So Eleutheria disappeared. Well, the interesting move here is that after offering it, Beckett then withdraws it, and pretty much everyone, including his publisher, agrees that it's not successful. 
Gatto was published in October 1952. Eleutheria was announced for publication and then withdrawn at the last moment. It's not actually even translated or published until after his death. Uh, this edition, for example, is from 1995. And it's really not that good. It's been described as a drama in the throes of resisting becoming a drama. Scholars see Beckett's first play as the place he was learning to risk absence, to empty the theatrical space, first of motive, then of character. So, yes, Bush, Eleutheria is not yet successful, but it is the beginning of it all. Shall we read a bit? Would that be helpful? There's a really great scene. Wait, hang on. Are we allowed to? What? I mean, you know, the Beckett estate is famously strict, and if we don't have the rights... No one has the rights. Right. But this isn't a performance. It's just a presentation, a academic research. There's different rules. Right, Nick? Yes and no. <laughs> well, which is it? Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> I actually deal with the estate a lot, Bush, so to call the whole thing stupid is a bit flippant, but especially when the whole reason we're here is to investigate Beckett and his work. Stupid. I think it's better all round if we don't do it. The play's called Freedom, for God's sake. Uh, people should be free to do whatever they want. I think I disagree. No one owns the copyright to the human condition. <laughs> well, all I can say is, if anyone reads Eleutheria, I can't be here. <laughs> Just pretend you're not here. Okay. <laughs> Only a small section. Just a scene. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd be open-minded. So I actually rehearsed a scene with a couple of actors earlier. And they should be just here. Dan? Ollie? We're ready for you guys. My name is Dan Weird. And I'm Ollie. Oh, Ollie, actually, can you talk into the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> like this? Perfect. We're going to do a scene from Beckett's first play, Eleutheria. In this scene, I play a glazier, fitting a new pane of glass into the window of the squat of Victor Krupp. And I brought along my son, my apprentice. Are you ready, Ollie? I think so. Tell me, Michelle. Yes, Dad? Are you happy with me? What does that mean, happy? How old are you? Ten. Ten. And you don't know what that means, happy? No. You know when there is something you enjoy, you feel good, don't you? Yes. Well, that's more or less what it is to be happy. So tell me if you're happy. I can't. Why not? I don't know. Is it because you don't go to school often enough? No, I don't like school. Would you like to be playing with your friends? No, I don't have any friends. I'm not mean to you. Oh, no. What do you like to do? I don't know. What do you mean, you don't know? Something has to be the matter. I like it when I'm lying in bed, just before I go to sleep. Then why is that? I don't know. Make the most of it. Yes, I will. You are still hungry? Yes, very hungry. Here, eat that. But it's yours. Eat. Are you not hungry anymore? No. Why is that? I don't know, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Good, right? Where did you get those costumes? Great <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so that's what we can't do. Is this an issue of censorship, though, or does this just come down to Beckett's freedom to assert his moral right not to have the play performed because he didn't like it? 
I mean, the whole, in fact, the copyright issue is what led to our current idea anyway, so let's talk about that, shall we? Yes, so we moved away from thinking about how we might perform the actual play itself. We became more interested in the historical and biographical circumstances in which Beckett wrote it. The Second World War. Yes, post-war Paris in the 40s. And in particular, Beckett's apartment on Rue des Favorites. Oh, but of course, this was in the olden days. <laughs> Suzanne, seen here on the left. Again, Nick, as the Beckett expert, maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about this time in Beckett's life? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Sam and Suzanne were living in this small apartment at the time of the Nazi occupation. Beckett was part of a resistance spy cell called Gloria SMH, and so fearing arrest, the couple flees Paris to go into hiding in the unoccupied zone in the south of France for the duration of the war. You have to keep in mind that at this time in history, the word freedom has very specific connotations, the freedom of movement being an obvious one. That's right. Sam and Suzanne attempted to flee Paris, but Beckett possessed no formal proof of his nationality or status and therefore ran the risk of being detained. Bush, do you mind? What? <laughs> the thing with the thing? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so he ran the risk of being detained indefinitely as an unregistered alien. So the point is, Beckett's experience of freedom and its limitations is very literal at this point. Very different, for example, from the existential concept of freedom that was popular later in post-war French philosophy. So, anyway, after the war, Beckett and Suzanne returned to Paris, returned to their apartment in Rue des Favorites, and there was considerable evidence that the place had been raided by the Gestapo. Uh, chairs and furniture upturned, books all over the floor, and strangely, soap was missing from the bathroom. But they got on with their lives, and Beckett settled into a period that he called the siege in the room, period where he writes his first play, Eleftheria, his other play, Waiting for Gatto, and his famous novels, which make up the trilogy. And this is also where we arrived in our research, in that apartment. We started to wonder if we could stage this apartment, reconstruct it, exactly, a room in Europe, one time in history. So we wrote to the Beckett estate, requesting access to the address. Nick wrote to Edward Beckett, Beckett's nephew. Seen here on the left. <laughs> Edward Beckett, who runs the Beckett estate, lives in the same apartment previously owned by his uncle, and so we were hoping we could go there and measure it, take photos, get floor plans, and then try to reconstruct it on stage. And he wrote back. But there was one small problem. It wasn't there, Nick. Why don't I just read his reply? <laughs> Dear Nicholas, as you say, it is an unusual request to reproduce SB's study as an installation. Straight away, there is a problem. Samuel Beckett did not move to this apartment until 1961, so any siege did not take place here. I look forward rather more to hearing about your other plans. <laughs> Best wishes, Edward. I was extremely embarrassed and said so. He replied, Dear Nicholas, don't be embarrassed. You have many other things to occupy your mind. <laughs> I never knew the flat in the Rue des Favorites before my time in Paris, so I can't help you there. All I know was that it was a very small apartment. On two levels, I seem to recollect, not a lot to go on. Best wishes, Edward. He seems like a nice man. Yes, <laughs> but we didn't get to see the apartment. We might. I don't know. <laughs> We've written a letter to the current residents. We're still waiting for a reply. Either way, whether we see it or not, that's where we're setting Beckett's first play. In Paris, in that apartment during the war. A time of borders and categories, a time when humans were being labeled and measured. The war, with its genocide, with its sudden restrictions on what people can do, where they can go, all this provides an alarming backdrop to understand Beckett's art to understand why he was so interested in showing the absurdity of that way of thinking, uh, especially when set against the ontological truth of nothingness. Maybe we should talk about nothingness. 
there's not much to say. Yeah, but one of the things I've noticed over the past few weeks as we've carried out this research, and before this project, I hadn't really read much of Beckett's work, but this word nothingness, it keeps coming up. It seems like it means something. The philosopher Theodore Adorno says that Beckett has given us the only fitting reaction to the situation of the concentration camps, a situation he never calls by name, as if it were subject to an image ban. An image ban? I guess the idea is that you can't show certain things. The horrors of war, for example. Well, for starters. Mm -hmm. But more than that, sort of everything. The idea is that Beckett says nothing can be shown anymore, not truthfully. There's been a catastrophe that affects all things. So in a way, you have to show nothing rather than something. I think I follow. Adorno goes on. <laughs> what is, he says, huh. is like a concentration camp. At one time, he speaks of a lifelong death penalty. The only dawning hope is that there will be nothing anymore. To Beckett, as to the Gnostics, the created world is radically evil, and its negation is the chance of another world that is not yet. Another world that is not yet. Can we go now? <laughs> you guys are still here. We're still here. <laughs> think about nothing, Stan. I think it's all there is. Body? Nothing is more real than nothing. That's Democritus. I know. <laughs> Me too. The void is a personal condition. Ham in Endgame says, I was never there. And in Eleftheria, Victor Krapp says, perhaps it is time that someone were simply nothing. And so that's where we are. That's where we've arrived at, where all the research has led us. We will recreate the apartment in Paris, but there will be nobody in it. Or they will be there and not there. We want to stage nothingness, a play with no actors. Great. That's just great. <laughs> What's wrong, Dad? Uh, I mean, Dad. <laughs> You're not needed. We'll find something else to do. Well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. with no actors. Why not? How would you do it? Well, we've only done initial tests, but it seems possible. We use a system of wires and magnets, moving chairs, tables, papers, that kind of stuff. And we'll hopefully use sound design to make it feel like there are people there when there Sorry. are not. Magnets? What? And the point is, I mean, this is the main thing. If we get it right, if we do it well, it wouldn't just be a load of tricks. It would be more than that. It would have feeling. The fact that all these people weren't there, that they felt like they couldn't be there, that they felt like ghosts. And by the end, if we get it right, by the end, the audience would forget there was no one there. They'd be in a kind of trance. That's what I hope. I hope if we get it right, the audience would actually think there's people there. Real people, when actually there's no one there, the audience would be in a sort of trance and start seeing. How do you stage life? What should it look like? You know, because reality, in a lot of ways, is a cover-up. 
you know, it's uh, the way things look normally. It's not how they really are. Reality is a cover-up, like covering up a crime. What crime? <laughs> crime that we're not really here, that we're just pretending to live, but really we're ghosts. So the whole of life is just a cover-up? Maybe. What's the covering up? History. Interesting. Maybe we should show you some of what we've been working on. Good idea. <laughs> so yes, to finish, let's present the start of our new script. Oh yeah, let's end at the beginning. This is the first scene <laughs> of our show, which will be called Beckett's First Play. Not Eleftheria. No. No, because that, that's Beckett's first play by Samuel Beckett. <laughs> <laughs> but this is Beckett's first play by Dead Centre. It begins as Beckett and Suzanne return to their ransacked apartment, their home violated, Europe broken. Let's set the scene. Scene of Beckett's first play by Dead Center. <laughs> 